Hi everyone, my name is Trey Ventor and I'm a race and black history educator based in the UK. Um, this is a reproduction of an earlier talk I did uh, for Northampton Rights and Equality Council and the Autism Champion Network based in Northampton. This session is an expansion on an essay I did on my, on my master's uh, where the, this paper looked at the uh, intersection of autism while black grounded in intersectionality as one of the core tenets of critical race theory so it's part it's part sociology uh, part history part autobiography um, but it's also due to the lack of uh, research in this area or specific autism while black um, much of it can be interpreted as speculative so, so taking things that we know about race already and how racism functions, taking what we know about disability and how ableism functions and sort of putting them together, which ends up with me um, finding more questions than actual answers. I'm not a neuroscientist, so this is not about the science, but, but things that will make the lives of autistic black people that much harder. This is something I've wanted to speak on for a while. Um, though I received a dyspraxia diagnosis when I was a child, it wasn't until I went to university in 2016 at 20 years old, I was made to think about autism when numbers of autistic students um, peer diagnosed. Self-diagnosis is increasingly common within marginalized groups, including women, racialized minorities, and trans and non-binary people. More recently, I've been engaging with the work of stand-up comedian Hannah Gadsby, who self-diagnosed her autism before she later received a formal diagnosis. The memoir Drama Queen by comedian Sarah Gibbs also details how self-diagnosis can be a starting point to a formal one. However, increasingly, self-diagnosis does not have to be the start of a road to a medical diagnosis, but the start of a journey towards self-acceptance. When you consider the barriers that exist in healthcare, for example, racism, misogyny, ableism, transphobia, and the like, diagnosis is a privilege not everybody has, especially when you find out the original science of autism is based on the experience of predominantly white boys. However, autistic people don't just start being autistic when they get that diagnosis. The fact that I have to go to TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter for info, for information about Black experiences of autism and really information about Black disability is as interesting as it is frightening. Where does one start a lecture about this? I found myself thinking hard about all the conversations I've had with autistic people and people with co-occurring neurological differences, including ADHD and dyspraxia. I came to policing. There have been many incidents involving autistic civilians and the police. When I was stopped and searched at 14 years old, I recall my emotions were running high and the encounter really left me with a distrust in the police. Many autistic people find the experiences of policing distressing. In the 2016 journal article, Laura Crane and colleagues discuss how in an online survey of 394 people, police officers in England and Wales, only 42% were satisfied with how they interact with, with autistic people. Whilst 37% of police officers had received autism training needed for policing, a need for training was further identified. This article discusses police responses in relation to autistic individuals and parents of autistic people who also echoed the need for training. Autistic encounters with the criminal justice system um, have been as victims and as suspects, and there are several publicized examples that show poor police conduct. For example, the commissioner of the police for the metropolis uh, versus ZH. This was a botched appeal by the London Metropolitan Police Service against the decision made when damages were awarded to ZH as the London Met broke common law 
and the 1995 UK Disability Discrimination Act. The context ZH was a mute, autistic, epileptic 16-year-old who also had learning disabilities. In September 2008, he was taken by the specialist school he went to to attend a swimming pool for a familiarisation visit or excursion. When things went awry during the visit, the manager of the establishment called the police, which gave rise to, escalating, to an escalating series of events leading to ZH jumping in the pool, being forcibly removed from the pool, being handcuffed and placed in a cage at the back of a police van for 40 minutes. ZH then suffered psychological trauma and an exasperation of his epileptic seizures. The ruling judge, Sir Robert Nelson, found the Met had committed the wrongful act of trespass and false imprisonment with further breaching his rights under Article 3, Article 5 and Article 8 of, of the European Convention for Human Rights and also uh, breaching the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act. The Met appealed and the court dismissed the appeal. The officers were judged to have acted hastily and to have been ill-informed ill after restraining ZH. A subsequent report by the Independent Commission on Mental Health and Policing highlights the lack of awareness to mental health issues and related knowledge amid police staff and officers, stressing there needs to be training for police and communicating about communicating with people with mental health issues learning disabilities, um, and also communicating with autistic people. Without the context of autism or epilepsy, in my opinion, this could easily have been as stereotyped, been as interpreted as a black person's encounter with the police, autistic, epileptic or not. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Edson da Costa, Rashan Charles, Sarah Reed, Eric Garner, Sarah Sandra Bland, George Nenchenko, Mark Duggan, Trayvon Martin, um, Joy Gardner, I could list um, the names of black people who were victims of the police forever. There are a few examples of violence that ha happened against disabled people that also have not happened to black people, either now or historically. One of the other examples of crossover between autism and blackness is this idea of curing autism. There are so many neurotypicals protect this idea of autism as a disease. Concurrently, under white supremacy, blackness is also presented the projections of white being the best, i.e. via beauty magazines with Eurocentric beauty standards. Furthermore, educational curricula, media, and our general culture present the idea there's something inherently wrong with blackness. Dabiri and Lau um, called this uh, this idea of something wrong being, being wrong with black Africanness as Afro pessimism. So this idea of curing uh, us because neurotypicals believe we have some sort of deficiency is an exceedingly common story I've been told by autistic friends and colleagues and even seen pervade through discourse on social media in the sense that autism and neurodivergent disabilities more generally and many physical disabilities are to be overcome which really absolves institutions of removing ableist barriers that are in place. In terms of neurological differences, this idea of curing something that you were born with is something I know twice over, both as a black person and as a neurodivergent person. As a black child, the world around me conditioned me to think that being white was the best and that blackness or brownness was wrong, that I could somehow cure my skin and culture and weigh of seeing and navigating the world and aspire to being white. That blackness was diseased and whiteness in all its definitions was, was seen as healthy and to be aspired to. Growing up, I loved the stories of the X-Men. And now as an adult, I am now understanding how it's possible to put that into a wider context of violence against black and disabled people. There are few things that disabled people have experienced that at one time or another um, have not also occurred against black people. There are lots of parallels between the X-Men stories and neurodivergence at large. In some cases, people 
also draw parallels between the civil rights movement in America, as this is also the time that the X-Men comics were originally introduced. The X-Men franchise is a good entry point into thinking about how discrimination through science impacts black people and disabled people, and thus autistic while black. Through these stories of the X-Men, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created relatable stories to me about demonization and bullying, which was further upheld in text by that society's institutions. The X-Men stories began in 1963. A group of teenage mutants helmed by their teacher and mentor, Charles Xavier, at his school for gifted youngsters. In those stories, mutants were hated by the so-called normal humans they defended, people that did not have abilities. In those stories, there were also anti-mutant hate groups, like Strikers Purifiers. The character Bolivar Trask, um, also played by Peter Dinklage in the film Days of Future Past, is reminiscent of the scientist leading the Spectrum 10K project in life. Autism Speaks has also long been thought of as a hate group by autistic people, and it does raise reflections with those hate groups in the X-Men mythos, including the, including the Sentinels, who were a brand of mutant-destroying uh, robots introduced in the 60s just as Black Americans were being abused by the police and segregation policies under Jim Crow laws. There are numbers of allegories that run through the X-Men that relate to Black people, Further for me, I see a lot of parallels between the X-Men and neurodivergence. Many autistic, many autistic people today continue to be persecuted in a world that wasn't designed for us in the first place. Societies, institutions, such as the police, prisons, schools, and workplaces, continue to be sites of trauma. There are also allegories between discrimination against LGBT plus communities and the experiences of the mutants in pursuit for equality and acceptance. In the 2003 film X-Men 2, Bobby Drake, AKA the Iceman, is asked by his parents if he's ever tried not being a mutant. This sort of phrasing, though not in those terms, was very familiar to many LGBT uh, plus people. Bobby Drake came out as gay in 2015 in the, in the, new, or in the all new X-Men issue 40. Being autistic or neurodivergent is a constant state of coming out, and that idea of policing difference is a constant through the X-Men. Many characters were born with their abilities and were then taught by, by elders how to manage them. What about those who are Black, disabled, and part of a wider gender and sexuality spectrum that exists outside of nuclear, cis, heterosexuality? The phenomena of the distinct experiences of Black disabled people, including autistic Black people, can be described under what psychologist Gwilen Kinwani termed as negra ableism. It goes on to play, name four axes where anti-Blackness meets ableism. She names infantilization, degeneracy, dangerousness, and superhumanization. Considering the way white autistic people are presented on television, they are infantilized. I'm thinking about programs like BBC's The A Word and also the program Young Sheldon on CBS. I begrudgingly reference the 2021 film Music, as well as the 1988 film Rain Man starring um, Dustin Hoffman, further to Sam Gardner as the main character in the Netflix series Atypical. These actors are predominantly white. Uh, these actors are predominantly autistic white boys, such men, are predominantly playing, sorry, are, are predominantly playing autistic uh, white boys and men. When you implement race into this, tracking this story to the plantation societies of the 17th and 18th century, enslaved black people were forever treated like children, needing the guiding hand of the white master, while also treated as superhuman. Infantilization is pervasive through ableist thinking, the projection that someone is unable to do for themselves or think for themselves. This can include talking to disabled people in baby talk, and it can also be addressing the parent, colleague, or friend of the autistic person without actually addressing the autistic person. There is also the fact of not allowing us the right to express and experience adult lives as we are expected to be naive and pure. And I use that term pure in in speech marks or inverted commas. The fact that autistic people 
swear, like to go out, have sex, drink alcohol, go to parties, and want to work. And really many of the things non-autistic and non-disabled people do, I find surprises a good many people. In the context of children, our society presents the image that parents know best and that children's rights do not matter. As um, the late Bell Hooks wrote, when we love children, we acknowledge by our very actions that they are not good, that they have rights and that we respect and uphold their rights. Without justice, there can be no love. Bell Hooks was a long defender of children's rights and dignity. So you must extend this philosophy to black children, autistic black children, disabled children. They are not exceptions. Black children today and yesterday, autistic or not, continue to be uh, infantilized. There is no consent, as we saw with the child Q case here in the UK. Dangerousness and disability have a long reaching relationship. Autistic people and violence come at an intersection stereotypes. That intersection, while Black, takes another turn. Kinwani writes that this alleged dangerousness is wrapped up around white projections of aggression, notions of bestiality, and out of controlness. It is this construction that leads to control and restraint measures and freedom deprivation disproportionately used when mental health services deal with Black people. This construction was central to the colonial endeavor, of course, and the need to tame and to tame, to control and domesticate the dangerous and wild other. As a black person in Britain today, I am four times more likely to be detained under the mental health. If I was upset, if I was upset on a mental health ward, um, I could be seen as out of control if I was visibly and physically upset and expressing my emotions. Revisiting the plantation society and during a meltdown, our artistic people, um, they, are, are artistic people dangerous or are they simply overwhelmed? Doing this while Black revisits the connotations of Black people, like dangerousness, violence, aggression, or in some cases upset is interpreted as anger. Well, as a black, well, as black people, we do feel the emotions of white people feel, and all people feel. This always, this isn't always interpreted like that in a racist society. We are expected to be superhuman, um, and this includes feeling nothing at all. The superhumanization of black men, in particular, is ob is most obvious in policing and mental health services, when disproportionate numbers of people can be deployed to restrain one man because we supposedly have superhuman strength and that we do not feel pain. Further to being treated, to, sorry, further to being restrained for long periods of time, as was in the case of black men like Eric Garner, who was killed much in the same way as George Floyd. Also David Bennett, um, who died in a similar scenario with, in, in, men, in a mental health ward in the UK, at the start of the century, which led to an inquiry. In his seminal work, The Souls of Black Folk, uh, African-American writer, sociologist, and historian W.E.B. Du Bois posed a question that is still as relevant to Black people today as it was at the start of the 20th century when he wrote, when he wrote it. How does it feel to be a problem? I know an excellent colored man, so, sorry, this language is dated from the time, or I fought at Me Mechanicsville, or do, these, do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or I'm interested. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? Yeah. Being a problem is a strange experience, peculiar, even, even for one who has never been anything else. Boys brings a brutal timelessness to conversations about the dehumanization of black people, including bodies and minds in the global north. I find this relevant in the realm of police violence. Since the resurgence of anti-racism, 
um, in 2020, interest in the experience of Black victims with police have been revisited. And for Black people in Britain, policing has been alongside of oppression and alongside of oppression. These experiences show a normative presenting story of Blackness, so a story of Black people in the UK that are cisgender, presumably straight, neurotypical, able-bodied, and often male and others, even within an oppressed group. In the 2020, autistic 13-year-old Lyndon Cameron was seriously injured after being shot by the police in Salt Lake City in America. But Cameron was white. Yet through the lens of Kimberly Crenshaw's 1989 treatise of intersectionality, it does not take long to realize how being black and autistic may amplify stereotypes of black people and autistic people, in spite of their race, are at greater risk of being stopped. A study done by the Drexel Autism Institute says that 20% of autistic teens in the US will be stopped and questioned by the police before they reach adulthood. And the assault on Troy Canals outside of his home in 2015, 17 years old at the time, was an example of what can happen um, when being autistic while black, compounded by both the discrimination that comes with race and disability. With black and autistic people respectively being at greater risk of police brutality, when we are both, this can compound the violence against us. Considering black children's interactions with the police, we must also think about adultification, where black children are viewed as older than they are. Child Q case that has come to public attention in the UK is an example of this. Um, for context, for those of you um, watching this outside of the UK, school teachers called the police on a black school girl in London who reportedly smelled of cannabis. She was 15 years old and was thus strip searched by London Metropolitan Police officers while on her period and had to remove her sanitary towel, towel. And they did not inform her parents. That girl is now traumatized. Whilst we do, whilst we do not know whether this girl is autistic, it would be reasonable to think about how black girls with black autistic girls are also at risk of police contact at greater risk of police contact, and neurotypical black girls are at risk as well. Okay, I would advise you now to take a, a five minute break or so just to digest um, what I've just talked about um, and talked about so far. Um, and if you don't want to have a break, just keep watching. Through the lens of intersectionality, we can widen our gaze to see how and what our eyes see is sometimes not what is happening. The recent Ozim Brown case showed how ableism and white supremacy come joined. A victim of the UK's ongoing hostile environment, he first came to Britain at four years old from Jamaica. Brown exists on an intersection, autistic, black male and immigrant. Brown experienced a life of injustice, unable to, get, unable to access his basic needs. All the way to last summer, where he was nearly deported to Jamaica. In the education system, Ozim was consistently labelled as rude, aggressive and disruptive until he was 16. After he was excluded from the school system, he received a formal diagnosis uh, for autism and then was transitioned to the foster system, where he was moved 28 times in the space of a year. He was cut off from his mother, and put into a foster system that was designed to fail him as it does so many black children and also neurodivergent children. He found solace with men in similar situations. One night, two of his friends stole a mobile phone. Ozim did not see it, but he was sentenced by the now unlawful joint enterprise guilty by association law, and he was thus imprisoned for five years. Under the hostile environment, he was set to be deported for a crime he did not commit to a country he had not seen since he was four years old. In prison, he had been over-medicated for control. Now isolated, prison guards stole his drawings and artwork, goading him into violence, his body now scarred by self-harm at regulating his pain. He was denied help and support in his education experience, and then a series of events further led him to be failed by the foster system 
the criminal justice system, and then the Home Office showing how Britain's institutions can act. The specific social harms black disabled people face is missing from conversations about anti-racism and ableism, including from the police. Of the numerous black people killed by the police in the US, many have disabilities and or mental health conditions, including Eric Garner, who was asthmatic, diabetic and had a heart condition, and he was killed much in the same way as George Floyd. Tanisha Anderson was bipolar. Sandra Bland was epileptic and also had depression. Deborah Danner was schizophrenic. Elijah McLean was autistic, and there are many others. Being disabled while black in America is a mandate for being at greater risk of police violence, where so many victims have been disabled and black. Talia Lewis describes ableism as a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normal, normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-blackness, eugenics, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's language, appearance, religion, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce excellence and, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Autistic and or disabled while black uh, has a very human context, especially when you do not have to be disabled necessarily to experience ableism as simply being black is disabling via our very reality of living under white supremacy. White supremacy is disabling would be the flip of that, of that comment. A system that allots values on people's bodies and minds, constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence and others. The education system for many autistic people can be a site of trauma. For autistic students, we do stim or have fidget objects, scripts where noise cancelling headphones, can't sit for long periods of time, avoid bright lights or even elope from situations, they are reducing themselves to fit into a metric that was not designed for them. Hyperfocus, hyperfocusing on special interests, while black goes back to those previous ideas about superhumanity. It still plays into this idea of those with neuro disabilities somehow mentally being somehow, being somehow mentally um, less than or deficient, which also includes being unable, and I use that term unable, unable and deficient in speech marks or inverted commas, to behave in the same way as neurotypicals. We get the tasks done, but when we do things too well, too quickly, people start to get suspicious and think that hyper productivity are somewhat subhumanly subhuman. Doing so while black, Reminds me our humanity always has qualifiers. We are disabled by our success, uh, disab disabled by our failures. As an undergraduate student, I remember being stigmatized for completing seemingly large assignments in short amounts of time. Hyperfocus or, or autistic flow enables me to get large amounts of work done in a small amounts of time and is very useful on, on a deadline. For example, I wrote my 8,000 word undergraduate dissertation in three days while on holiday. And I don't say that to boast, but as an example of the extremities which I can focus. But then on the other hand, that's my experience. There will be other autistic people who may not be able to hyper-focus and cannot work in such ways. And that is absolutely fine. And when neurotypicals couldn't work in the way I worked, they turned me into the problem. A black person excelling in self-directed study uh, while they struggled. On my master's course, however, I was in my element as I loved doing the, I loved doing the research for my essays and my dissertation. It allowed me to deep dive topics I was interested in, and the same sort of thing happened when I published a journal article last year on Jane Austen, white supremacy, and the National Trust. When you read that essay, neurotypicals. Uh, may be boggled at the links I make. That out-of-the-box thinking is because of neurodivergence, not in spite of it. 
for that body to hit the big save is good, but it's also hindering when the recoil hits. During a creative writing undergrad, I think my ability to hyperfixate and even in some cases skip seminars worked in my favor. Some days my lecturers would email me as they had not seen me in a while. There is a culture in academia that being in lecture, lectures is necessary for all students to succeed. But for me, I know I did well because I wasn't at seminars all the time. My course was a whitewashed curriculum and I was surrounded by whiteness. Me being in those rooms multiple times a week, whilst it may have shown other students and staff that I was committed, it was also a health risk. A not so covert operation of white supremacy by the curriculum. Also, my seminars were designed for group interactions. So in terms of my specific traits, this impeded my ability to get work done. I saw my seminars as a barrier my study and development, not an enabler of it. Seminars can sometimes be barriers to learners that are too self-directed, too introverted, too independent, and too independent for institutional life. Speaking to autistic people, whilst we share commonalities, we are all individuals and are very different as well. Autism and, and any other neurodiver neurological difference, while black, needs its own approach for each person. This also flies in the face of many, many working cultures, including schools and universities. How many lecturers know all their students by name, especially on larger courses? The way higher education is constructed doesn't allow the time and space for lecturers to know their students as human beings, and that's hurt, that, and that hurts. Autistic adults can interpret, can interrupt frequently, Sometimes they may have problems with teamwork um, and that, and doing that as a black person may have onlookers thinking of you as uncomfortable. Autistic people are more prone to mental health issues, uh, not exclusively from their autism, but because the world is on a different metric and how institutions see and treat you on a day to day. So many I know struggle with depression and anxiety for these reasons. There's lots of crossover with this and LGBT plus communities as well. Not because they are gay, lesbian, trans, non-binary, bisexual, et cetera, et cetera. But because societal cultures of violence have, been, have normalized homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera, and how that is upheld. What about black um, autistics that are trans and non-binary? Those who are gay? or bisexual or lesbian and the intersectional crossovers that exist between ableism, racism and discrimination against members of the LGBT community and also that those intersections with, with mental ill health. Lots of autistic people don't just have autism. Many also have co-occurring neurological differences like ADHD or dyspraxia, which is what I was originally diagnosed with um, as a child, dyspraxia that is. Dyspraxics have more than our fair share of coordination and perception difficulties. Lots of these things are black impact how you are seen in environments already anti-black by design. Behaviors that will make black people uh, be seen as violent or mentally or intellectually um, less than by their colleagues, possibly even from other black people who have internalized those ways of thinking. My university experience uh, my undergraduate experience, that is, was also riddled with examples of Black people policing their own behaviours, not in terms of me and myself in the White Academy, but or not, not initially, but how I saw Black students were treated. In my disability, I policed my own body language, my behaviour, afraid that if I was to express myself too openly, that would be, that would be, that would be construed as violent, as violent. I saw the numbers of black students who were being policed in halls of residence and the numbers of black students expressing happiness outwardly were being thought of as violent by their lecturers and professional services. Many black British students came from parts, came from, came from parts of North and South London. And I would see their big smiles and expressions of joy and wonder and love 
and them just being themselves. Um, in, but in private, in public, they were completely different people. Lots of white people are not used to seeing black joy and black happiness. They're used to the trauma narratives of police violence, enslavement, and colonialism with black people in positions of subjugation. Within the neoliberal university, or in the neoliberal society in general, I do struggle to fit. In the lived experiences of black people then, this way of seeing reminds me of the, that intersectional violence is an ever present force in our society. But sociologist Patricia Hill Collins argues that intersectional violence, in, sorry, intersectional paradigms are a reminder that oppression cannot always be narrowed down to singular things and that multiple forms of violence can work together to produce disadvantage. Historically speaking, you can see how race and disability uh, were stigmatized in Nazi Germany, especially during the Holocaust, where black people, including, including children, were looked upon as inferior. To grasp these ideas, we need to see how far back concepts of difference go, as Paul, as Paul Taylor um, writes in his book Race, or the ancient world uh, was for many of its inhabitants a world of multiple peoples. Often enough, these peoples were sorted into two sets, us and them. However, it was in the days of Europe's empire building that race scientists, and I use that term race scientists again in inverted commas, uh, drew on physical, physical and cultural differences to emphasize this idea of us and them. Where science journalist Angela Sayini writes that what Europeans saw as cultural shortcomings in other populations in the early 19th century soon became conflated with how they looked. The fact we tick a box on application forms or on the census and across society in relation to race and ethnicity is due to these early colonizers who, invent, who essentially invented race. In 1795, um, a German physician known by, as Johann Blumenbach surmised that humanity could be sectioned to racial groups, Caucasians, Mongolians, Ethiopians, Americans, and Malays. He did not use the term Caucasian to only mean those read as white, but to include people also from India and North Africa, with Blumenbach concluding, I have taken the name of Mount Caucasus both because its neighborhood, its neighborhood on Southern Slope produced the most beautiful race of men. By seeing how race was made, black people as targets in Nazi Germany, and even now, even now today, is predictable. Nazi policies were entrenched in eugenics, um, described by and described by Angela Sayini and Adam Pearson as uh, the controversial idea that we can improve the quality of the human race by selecting who can and who could not reproduce. Eugenics targeted specific groups of people, including the working class, the disabled and people of color, sterilized in the name of science and went on to inspire the Nazis becoming a driving force for those Nazi death camps. These ideas do not sound too dissimilar to the beliefs perpetuated by European race scientists and thinkers in the 18th and 19th centuries. So that's half time. Um, so I'll say go and have a drink or something or get something to eat. Um, and, if you, and if you don't need to, just carry on. In, the, in relation to Nazi Germany, Robert Kesting, Kesting argues that after 1937, over 300 black children disappeared without a trace. Further commenting on the speculation they were deported to killing centers. On the other hand, we could also argue that being black in the eyes of race scientists was the same as being thought of as unintelligent and incapable of thought, thus ableism and its intersections with anti-blackness. Following Talia Lewis and how, and how ideas of white and black were constructed, we can see that intimate relationship between blackness and ableism, or anti-blackness and ableism. These racial hierarchies continue to exist today. Nero, Brian Nero articulates racial hierarchies via Carl Linnaeus's 17, 1767 treatise on the slides there. 
the race science that preceded the Nazi regime reminds me to be black, to reminds me to be black in Nazi Germany was to be viewed as less than human. Disability also took the meaning of not only physical differences, but also neurological ones. And what we now call neurodivergence, these differences would have then have been stigmatized. Comparatively, looking at this history now, and seeing how, seeing how racism and ableism compound each other, Black disabled people in Nazi Germany had also been at risk of this triple threat of violence since blackness and disabilism are not just intimately linked under white supremacy, but disability also meant hereditary diseases and mental health issues. The stigmatization of blackness was racist and, and ableist, as being black was considered to be less than human. The neurotype autism was founded in the Nazi era by a man called Hans Asperger, who, who has since been said reportedly to have collaborated in the executions of his children. Due to this, there is a common discourse amid autistic advocacy circles that we should be moving away from that term, Asperger's, as a term for describing autistic people. Simply, autism is just autism, regardless. In the backdrop of this history of eugenics, if this happened now, autistic Black people would have been targeted viewed as unworthy of procreation, contaminating the so-called purity of the human gene pool. While in the early 1900s, we begin to see disturbing links between British researchers at University College London and race scientists in Nazi Germany, in Germany not Nazi Germany, just Germany, with UD Fischer's hair gorge being used to measure the whiteness of mixed race people. Following the first genocide of the 20th century, which took place in Namibia, committed by the German Empire. Eugenics has a long history entrenched in the schema of anti-blackness and ableism. So when we hear about black autistic encounters, police and other public services, it is part of a longer individual and collective historical story in a world where eugenics and race science have left their mark. Disability discrimination and racism sit entwined to the people who are, who are celebrated, entwined with the people who are celebrated as heroes in our public domain. For example, Winston Churchill, or so should I say Sir Winston Churchill, was voted um, the greatest Britain by the British public in 2002, in a 2002 poll, and then put on a five pound note in 2000, 2016, in spite of his, in spite of being a pioneer of, white supremacy and eugenics. Colonial statues were being toppled in 2020, while we still see resistance to teaching colonialism on the UK national curriculum in schools. Critical race theory is being contested uh, inside and outside of party politics, whilst it also gives, whilst it also gives us an analytical tool for seeing why so many people are impacted by racism. Like colonialism, eugenics is often, or at least in my experience, seen as something from a bygone era, a past time. With autism advocacy circles, autistic people are still having to debunk things like applied behavioral analysis. So ABA therapy is still being pushed on the parents of autistic children by doctors in the face of a stigma that still exists against disability and autism in, in social spaces. Britain has largely written off ABA uh, but it comes in the UK with another name. So think about conversion therapy um, and gay communities and, the, and that, that history there. However, just because ABA is not really prominent in this country in, in, in its form as ABA, um, but as it is in America, that does not mean Britain is free from this conversation. But in America, ABA is still thought of a somewhat good practice. At one point in Chris Puffin's documentary, excuse the title, Asperger's Blue, they follow Chris to the New England Center for Children. It's a special education school based in Southborough, Massachusetts. In this documentary, the CEO likens ABA therapy with educational chemotherapy. And that's a quote. It comes back to, it comes back to how eugenics is defined under, under removing traits that may be considered by some as imperfect. 
today, I think it is a sad afterthought of trying to play God and a throwback to the last century. Through the UK's COVID-19 response that, that has disproportionately impacted the elderly and the disabled, you might want to consider how the most vulnerable have been thrown under the bus in favour of the economy, at least in the in British context. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted everyone in different ways, but the disruption to things like routine and structure has been especially hard for many autistic people, including families with children. Support services have been withdrawn and the mental health crisis is set to get worse. Autism was founded by a Nazi collaborator. Anti-blackness, eugenics and ableism are intimately linked. COVID-19 was particularly detrimental to many of the communities also implicated in historical eugenicist violence. The elderly thrown under the bus through COVID-19 in the UK may have also included um, Holocaust survivors, who left one violent regime for another. Racial theories that saw so many children confined to those death camps like Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Westerbrook. Now telling stories that touch the face of tyranny, as was said in the BBC documentary, My Family, The Holocaust, and the led by um, celebrity judge Robert Rinder. And now, um, being left, being left um, to die as part of the UK's ageing population in the UK government's herd immunity tactics. Disproportionately, that disproportionately, um, that disproportionately killing and harming elderly dependents in the same vein as the eugenics of the last century. Well, more recently, Cambridge University's Spectrum 10K project, DNA of Autistic People with Wellness, it was criticised by many of the people it was apparently designed to help. As the project saw widespread criticism in spite of race, it is worth thinking about how Spectrum 10K has the ability to harm people across numerous social markers like race, gender, sexuality, class, and others. Spectrum 10K may have been directed at autistic people. But when you consider the, this neurotype across society, this is a Black Lives Matter issue. It's also about trans lives and gay lives and the lives of working class people, women, non-binary, and many more. It's about everyone and everything that is important and everything that's important. Increasing, increasing the baseline for human life for the most vulnerable are not having to fight um, things like this. Here it is, we need to think about how historic harms can manifest themselves in the violence Crimberly Crenshaw conceptualizes in, 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 in intersectionality, while also popular cultural narratives of autism are also only producing white centered stories about autism and disability. Thus, these sorts of violence are not being seen um, in the context of black and brown people. As Audre Lorde said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead sing we do not live single single issue lives. And that's from her book, um, Sister Outsider, in case you're interested. In screen media, autism has a white privilege issue, and the film and TV industry's decision to continue to present white males as really the only face of autism is implicitly stating only their stories are of human value in entertainment. With a white operating standard, it is not surprising to see autistic black people harmed by our institutions. The experience of autistic black people um, are slipping through the cracks since the whiteness of films and TV shows of autism reflects this introverted violence of white supremacy. Uh, as Charles Mills writes, implying the existence of a system that not only privileges whites, but is run by whites for white benefit. With original autism studies done on the white male brain, why should a society built on racism and misogyny include black and brown people, women, et cetera, et cetera, into representations of autism? Isn't this entirely in character? 
in response, there have been criticisms that these studies are based on racist and misogynist science. In the last decade, some of the most popular screen media texts have featuring autistic adults have centered white male narratives, including the Big Bang Theory, The Good Doctor and Rainbow. Depictions of racialized minorities falter in media, since as Richard Dyer writes, at a level of representation, whites are not of a certain race, they are just the human race. However, Temple Grandin and Please Stand By uh, come to mind uh, when thinking about autistic women on screen. Yet representations of autistic black adults are minimal, and I've yet to see one. So if anyone does know of any um, films or TV programs that feature black autistic characters, um, including adults in lead roles, I would like to know. In screen media then, the term human is synonymous or interchangeable with white, as only they can take up the space of autistic person, really excluding any intersectional discourse on neurodivergent disability as a collective. In the context of re representation, the universality of whiteness could also could also be synonymous with white maleness. Um, the late whiteness studies academic Ruth Frankenberg believed that in relation to white boys and men, uh, white girls and women had to be pure, passive, and support the ideals of the white man. As both Hannah Gadsby and Sarah Gibbs show, the fact autistic traits in girls differ to boys may run contrary to this universality that whiteness presents and might prove provoke a challenge to patriarchy. Since whiteness is as, as um, Kawan Bhopal further states, it was a historical privilege and power, although it may work differently for white working and middle class groups and other intersectional identities. Whiteness is not just an individual identity, it is embedded in different institutions such as schools and the media as being the predominant identity. In such white spaces, whiteness and white Western practices are the norm, and those which do not comply are seen as outsiders and others. The white practices and identity of whiteness are afforded a kind of privilege that dominates all others, in which these privileges are only available to white groups who operate in these spaces, often at the expense of non-white groups. In summary, um, sociologists Sociologist Kawak Bhopal's conceptualization of whiteness applies just as well to the film industry, film and TV industry, as it does to healthcare, education, sports, recruitment, and so on. As even in disability, autism is still something, something owned by whiteness and white people and white ways of seeing the world. Moreover, for autistic black girls and autistic black women, ableist encounters work simultaneously. Moya Bain's misogyny, where race and gender can both play roles in bias. The idea that the popular mainstream depictions of autistic girls and women have been white is really reaffirming whiteness and the white gaze as operating standard. Further to the fact that society continues to treat black girls and women as invincible, while black girls experience adultification compounded by the colonial racial hierarchies I mentioned earlier. These ideas of childhood were not made for black children. So even as young people, we are forced to become adult before we are ready. Childhood is privilege. And in the infantilization of autism on screen, white children receive the privilege of some representation while we receive very little or even none. And that's, and that's not to say autistic white children have it easy because many of them don't but it's not because of their race. Mainstream media, uh, continuing with this white standard does not cater for the diversity of lived experiences. Through an intersectional gaze, we may begin to see how anti-blackness and ableism compound each other and how the lack of representation of this on screen does not impact autistic white people. Since their experiences, even autistic ones, are treated as the norm, as with Dyer writes, there's no more powerful position than that of being just human. The claim to power is the claim to speak for the commonality of humanity. Race to people can't do that. They can only speak for their race, but non-race to people can, for they do not represent the interests of a race. 
the whiteness marked as the default. It provoked me to seek out more diverse, if I can use that term, examples of neurodivergent um, or neurological differences beyond television. Um, so here are some of the social media accounts that I have come across simply to gain some alternative understanding around ADHD, autism, and dyspraxia. Stuart Hall on the left uh, believed that mainstream media representations had an agenda and consumers should find alternative sources for truth and information. S social media is part of that mainstream now, but I still find it more accessible than the films and TV shows that get made. In, in relation to autism, um, while black, an ideology could be that presiding media centers white male gaze as the white male gaze as universal. Stuart Hall did not believe in the faceless masses and saw uh, microcosms of resistance that undermined dominant media narratives. With modern representations of autism, I can see, I can see the diversities of social media personalities uh, countering narratives peddled out by the main establishment media with the TV and films that get made. To understand the criticisms of the whitewashing of disability, we must also look beyond white privilege. So, Sarah Ahmed writes that declaring whiteness even in the case of one and racism, when declaration is assumed to be evidence of an anti racist commitment, is not what it says. Thus, neither the recognition nor the declaration really change anything much. White people centering themselves on what they can, what they can do to help, um, and I say they can do to help in, in inverted commas as well, has the ability to hurt anti-racist struggle and resistance, even in good intent, since it ultimately centers whiteness. And she thus argues that whiteness studies should involve at least a double term. To turn towards whiteness is to turn towards and away from the bodies who have been given agency and mobility by such privilege. In other words, the task for white subjects would be to stay implicated in what they critique, but in turning towards their role and responsibility in these histories of racism as histories of the present, to turn away from themselves and towards the other. I would say we should have another break there, so press pause. I'll then come back to this later um, if, if you want. Or you can just continue as well. So we must, cent so we must not center whiteness, um, but consider the impact the normalization uh, of whiteness has had on those racialized outside of it. Charles Mills, or the late Charles Mills as well, believes society would benefit more from reframing conversations about white privilege into one about white supremacy. Mills identified uh, dimensions through which white supremacy operates. I started this talk looking at autism, racism, and the police and the criminal justice system. His judicial sphere is in relation to politics the construction of laws and their usage in the legal system. The black autistic police brutality victims, Troy Canals and Elijah McLean, this places them into a wider context of over policing black communities, further to the disproportionate imprisonment of black people um, in America. The fact they are also autistic is amplified because of their blackness um, and autism and the stereotypes that exist and that come with that. The Ozimi Brown case also acts as a good case study for a UK context. Moving along to the cultural sphere, this is most relevant to mention screen media text. It panders to the continued centering of white people as the default in the human experience of entertainment, including the way history is covered. The latest research in Black Lives Matter saw a reinterest in putting black history on the curriculum. However, what this what the conversation did not cover. What these conversations did not cover is that also means conducting intersection and conducting intersectional analysis, including including historical takes on disability or black. For example, the story of Mary Mary Prince 
who contracted rheumatoid arthritis and chronic back pain through her experiences of plantation slavery. I think black historical narratives still often follow a cisgender, very much heterosexual, neurotypical, abled norm, able-bodied norm. We really need to go wider, including, if, including in the Black History Month campaign. Next is the cognitive evaluative, evaluative sphere. Um, that revolves around colonial epistemologies, so basically colonial knowledge making that centers white ways of seeing, acting, and being in the world. The reasons why global northern screen media and producing houses focus on autistic, cisgender, white, heterosexual boys may not be exclusively be due to the fact that original autism studies were done on white, on white boys, but also because historically white Western ways of thinking and seeing were constructed as what was normal. Sophia Ackle writes that the way in which we come to know and view the world is learned through our lifetimes. The British, M the British education system itself is firmly rooted in colonial epistemology. What this can look like in schooling is a whitewashed retelling of the history of empire, omitting its, omitting its evils, the voices of the oppressed and the lasting legacy of imperialism today. Within education, there exists a complex web of coded and overt systems through which systems of knowledge are legitimized, those which fit a narrow conservative view of British values and the government of the day's agenda. What Sophia Ackle writes is applicable to the whitewashing of disability, but, but it also forces me to consider how autistic black people are pushed not only to act neurotypical, aka masking, protect ourselves from neurotypical violence, but also not to put too fine a point on it, code switch to act in ways that are comfortable to white people. We are the diversity and we also do diversity work. Sarah Ahmed also goes into this in her chapter, Rocking the Boat, Women of Color as Diversity Workers, which is in an edited book called Dismantling Race in Higher Education, edited by Jason Arday and Heidi, Heidi Safia uh, Mirza. Diversity is about bodies, not equity, and ultimately upholds capitalist takes of what success looks like. Bodies, productivity, or lack of productivity. We are included and then pushed to mass, and in many cases, at, forced at like our managers to survive. The next dimension is the somatic sphere. This is how society sees bodies, but I would take this further. Following the ideas of Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, Patricia Hill Collins, and others, somatically black autistic bodies could be seen differently, or maybe seen differently to black neurotypical ones, with black autistic girls also being at the brunt of adultification and misogyny and boys being subject to just the i.e. these stereotypes will be amplified in police encounters, engaging with education providers, mental health services, healthcare and others, violence being done to both black and autistic people. Charles Mills also names a philosophical metaphysical sphere. It refers to the idea that our very conceptualization of humanity is rooted in white. For a black British person to be asked, where are you from, as I have, uh, from white people who have seen I look different to them is embedded in the white supremacy. That's not to say these people are white supremacists per se, or are intentionally being racist. They might just be curious. But the underpinning idea of that question is that British people of color are other. Our Britishness always has qualifiers attached. As Afua Hirsch writes, this question is asked by the polite and open-minded, reserved for people who look different, asked for an explanation every single day, often multiple times, a symptom of the fact we don't really know what it is to be British. Is someone like me or us included? In conclusion then, this idea of autism while black is a way of seeing how discrimination and violence can compound itself in a world that privileges other ways of being 
that have been constructed as the norm. It also it is also built on prior histories where ableism and anti-blackness can often be similar in the lives of black people. That discrimination based on disability is ableist. Anti-blackness is also racist and ableist. When you look at how race was invented, intersectionality is not perfect. It is an analytical tool and one of the core tenets of critical race theory. The lives and histories of black people and disabled people have more in common than they do not. Talia Lewis's definition of ableism reminds me how ableism and white supremacy are part of what Patricia Collins called a matrix of domination and what Gulen Kinwani called um, Negro ableism. To see how violence functions, we do not necessarily need to always go to new work, though new work is always useful and I love to read it. So scholars have been talking about this in different ways for centuries, talking about violence in different ways for centuries. The lineage of writing about inequality in Britain, of course, and everything else can be traced to the scholarship of white men. I will end with Friedrich Engels, who many of you may know for his work with Karl Marx. Social murder, where you do not need to see the murderer to talk about institutional violence. When one person kills someone else and death occurs, we call that manslaughter. And when the doer knew prior to the act, that is murder. When society backs people into a corner where they are put in social harm debate and are dying early, they meet an, an unnatural and untimely end, one which is by any means as lethal as, as an encounter in the street, either by sword or bullet, when it prevents people from accessing vital services and conditions they cannot live, forces them through the cloud of the law in such conditions. So death occurs as a consequence or even um, harm, or even violence, harmful violence, where the state knows that thousands will be harmed. And yet these conditions continue. It is violence as sure as the striking down of an individual. The Windrush scandal, which saw the deaths of Caribbean elders before that time. At least nine people have died uh, before receiving compensation. Thinking about the numbers who have been killed by austerity. Think about the government's response to COVID-19. It is invisible violence against which few can defend ourselves or themselves because the death or harm of the person appears to be natural. Since the act is more of not doing than doing murder or harm it is. Intersectionality began as an analytical tool to look, at, to look at the relationships between race and gender and it itself is intersectional, born from um, American legal studies and black feminism in the US. However, there's a history of black writing about the intersections before Crenshaw um, created the language for it. Black writers such as Nikki Giovanni, Angela Davis, Alice Walker, Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins, um, Mary Prince, and the Black women of the 19th century who, who went on to write about their own experiences in plantation slavery show that autism while Black, disability while Black, it's, an histor it's as historical as it is sociological. There was a very human context for it as well. Lot of the writing on autism is scientific, um, mainly by neurotypical researchers and scientists and the like, not from the perspectives of autistic people. So I would urge you to, I would urge you to look look at all look at what autistic people are saying about their experiences, and then comparing it to what you've heard as well, and comparing the, what you see on social media, for example, to what you see on television. Um, here's a li further list of social media accounts that you can go and look at and follow and see what they're posting um, for your own education as well. I've learned more about autism and neurodivergent disability from social media accounts um, than I have from film and TV. And I find that shocking. It's completely unacceptable, really, that, that there is a lack of representation on TV in that regard, but there's more representation on social media. So. We've got work to do and lots of it. Thank you very much. 
um, for listening. Um, in the in the um, video description, you'll find a link to the referencing list as well, which will link you to a Padlet document um, full of references that I've used in this presentation, but also further reading where there's, there was no time where there was no time to go into things into more detail. So, for example, eugenics. For example, so there's lots of reading about eugenics and what it is and, and what it, and what it and about it and that, and that sort of stuff. But yeah, um, thank you very much um, for listening.